Amen. Thank you very much, Docas. Um, praise the Lord, everyone. I hope I am audible. Maybe Docas, you can just confirm. Yes, you're very audible. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much, Docas, for starting us off and for that wonderful time of prayer of committing our fellowship this evening to the Lord. And I will not add to that, but maybe at the end, we will I'll pick it up from there. Um, once again, you're all very welcome. Uh, it is a joy and a privilege to be able to share with you this evening. Our theme is the kingdom of heaven, a hidden treasure. It's taken from Matthew chapter 13, verses 44, um, 45 and 46. It's a parable that should not be strange to most of us um, because parables are quite popular. People often talk about them. Uh, also because uh, the, the times when Jesus used them was is contentious. Some people like to ask, why did Jesus use parables? It's as if he didn't want the people to understand. He didn't want them to understand. And we will find those questions in the scripture today. But I wanted to begin by helping us um, frame our thinking, even as we listen to this message. I don't know what you consider a treasure or what in your life is very valuable, but simply from the meaning of the word treasure, it is something that is of great value, something that is precious, something that has such a value that it is distinct from all the other things. And often when we speak of things that we value or that we think are very, very important to us or things to which we attach a very high price, we call them treasures. But they are treasures for which we even fail uh, to name a price, treasures that are of immeasurable value, treasures that it could be a person, maybe for some people it is a child who uh, it, it was very difficult to have. Um, for some people it could be a parent who they feel their life, if not for their parent, would not be. Um, for some people, it could be a mentor, someone you look up to, who you feel has had such a great influence or impact on your life. For some people, it could be a thing which they feel they can't do without. But of course, in the scriptures, we are always directed to, to the Lord, and we will see that as well. So picking it up from Matthew chapter 13, we recognize if your Bible is open to Matthew 13, you immediately must recognize it because it is famous for the parable of the sower, one of the most common parables. So immediately Matthew chapter 13 starts, we are in parables. And the Bible says in verse one, on the same day, Jesus went out to the house and sat by the sea and great multitudes were gathered together to him so that he got into a boat and sat and the whole multitude stood on the shore. Then he spoke many things to them in parables saying, and so the parable of the sower begins. Um, so often Jesus spoke to the people in parables. And within this same passage today, his own disciples ask, they wonder, they think to themselves, why do you speak to the people in parables? And this is in verse 10, just after the parable of the sower. Because verse 10 says, and the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? Notice that the disciples seem to distinguish themselves. They seem to say, that's not how you talk to us. But why do you talk to them like that? The disciples seem to see a difference in when you speak to us, it is clear. We seem to understand what you're saying. But what you're telling the people, this multitude that is before you, it doesn't seem to be clear. It often leaves them with more questions than answers. Then Jesus responds in verse 11. Be, he answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Verse 12, for whoever has, to him more will be given and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, 
Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of these people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Verse 16, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. What an interesting response. Here are the disciples. They have been following Jesus. He has called them to be with him. He has been teaching them. He has been walking with them, living with them. They have had a glimpse and an understanding of his mission, why he has come into the world. He has come to preach the message of the gospel, the good news, a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, a message of faith in him that brings eternal life. And they expect that indeed Jesus wants to speak to all people that they would come to know him. They have seen the miracles he has performed. They have seen him heal, resurrect people. They have seen him do all sorts of things. And they believe that indeed this is the Messiah, the one whom God promised would redeem Israel. And so to turn to him out of concern and wonder, Lord, why do you speak to the people in parables? And this is the response that Jesus gives them. In summary, in Jesus' response, he references a portion from Isaiah. And when we go to Isaiah, we will learn that this was a judgment on the nation of Israel, on people that had rejected God, that had turned away from God. And God's judgment on them was they would hear everything that the prophet is saying. They would see it, but they would not understand. They would not perceive it. It is a terrible thing to be under the judgment of God. It is a terrible thing to be rejected by the one who opens his arms for all to come. Often um, we struggle with this truth because it seems to take the power out of our hands, the power to choose life, um, the power to decide our destiny, but that is because God is sovereign. We are... We often engage in missions and evangelism and sharing the gospel. And many times people are disappointed when the message of the gospel is not received with as much enthusiasm or with as much joy as they would expect it to be. Perhaps they feel discouraged that it could be the way they presented it or the way they were dressed or maybe the approach they used But many times we forget that the work of salvation, the work of bringing people out of darkness into the kingdom of light is a work of God. So much so that Jesus is telling his disciples that there are people to whom this has not been given. And I want us to note that language because then we can appreciate how blessed we are. That there are people who day in, day out, are hearing the message of the gospel being spoken from the street corners, along the roads, on radios, on TV, everywhere. I like to say often that we are in a gospel-saturated society because almost everywhere you turn, there is someone or some people at least claiming to be speaking about God or about Jesus. I don't know which route you use as you go through town or as you travel, but a day doesn't go by where I don't pass by a preacher on the street. And so you would ask yourself, how come with all this message, with all this passion going around people preaching and speaking of Jesus, speaking of the last days, speaking of our need of salvation, why would people not believe? Why would we not have throngs of people flooding into churches every Sunday and leaving the the rest of the nation empty? And Jesus here offers us a response that is difficult to take, but it is the truth that God has chosen people whom he has called, to whom he has given a blessing of knowing about his kingdom and welcoming them into his kingdom. So in verse 16, speaking to the disciples, Jesus tells them, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your 
ears for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Many prophets and righteous men before the coming of Jesus desired and longed to see the Son of God, to see the consolation of Israel, to see God's plan for the redemption of man. Men of faith, women of faith who walked with the Lord. An example that is that is printed in my mind is of Simeon. I don't know if you recall that man called Simeon who longed and waited in the temple and begged the Lord not to let him die until he had seen the consolation of Israel. And when Simeon saw Jesus in the temple that day, his response in saying, now, Lord, you may let your servant depart because he had finally seen God's chosen servant, God's son who had come to take away the sins of the world. That background is important for us because the parable we are looking at today is within this text. And so when we think about treasure, when we think about the kingdom of heaven, it is easy to see it from the perspective that we are the ones who have somehow worked for or labored so much that we have gotten into possession of this treasure. But it is God, his mercy, his grace, who has called us, who has removed the veil from our eyes and has brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. So when we consider our portion for today, so when we scroll down to verses 44, this is what the Bible says. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. There are other parables about the kingdom of heaven within the same chapter, like the parable of the mustard seed, that again are quite well known, where people compare that, where the scriptures compare the kingdom of heaven to a mustard seed, a seed so small, but when planted, grows into a very huge tree. In this instance, our Lord uses an illustration that should be appealing to all of us. Earlier at the beginning, I talked about a treasure or what you find valuable, what you think you can't do without, what, what you, where your security is. In very simple terms, when we think of things that are of great value, if you have a savings account where you have some money put aside for a rainy day, if the worst were to happen, if you were to lose your job or the house caught fire or something terrible happened, you would have a sense of peace in knowing I have a reserve somewhere. Or if it is a person, like I said earlier, you know you're in trouble, you're mixed up in something, but you know you have, a, they, these days we call them a gamba nog, someone who if you call, there, there is no issue that they can't resolve, whether it is with the police, whether it is with the army, you have someone you can call. Or perhaps, like I said earlier, it could be a parent whom you've relied on and know that whatever you ask, they are willing to give. But here, our Lord likens the kingdom of heaven to a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid and for joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. A few things for us to learn from this parable, which the people in that day may not have grasped, the people, the multitudes to which Jesus spoke may have wondered, what does a kingdom have to do with treasure? Why is it hidden in a field? Why is someone selling everything they have to purchase this treasure? What's the treasure anyway? A few chapters before this, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus speaking again to a multitude of people tells them, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Actually, we can turn there, Matthew chapter 6, if your Bible is open, and we will read it together. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
So at the beginning, when I kept asking you what your treasure is, what, what do you value the most? Whatever that thing is, it will have the attention of your heart. It will have the full allegiance and loyalty of your heart. And so Jesus here again, speaking to a multitude, warns them and says, don't let your treasures be on earth. Let them be in heaven. Why? Because where your heart, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we turn to our parable in Matthew 13, 44. And I want um, to suggest what this parable indicates or could indicate. When we think of a treasure, when we think of what is it that is worth giving up everything that you have so that you may have it. When we think through the whole counsel of scripture, when we think through the whole story of the Bible, what is so valuable that a man, a woman, ought to let go of everything that they may possess that thing? There are only two things that come to mind. The first is Jesus himself. Because no one else throughout scripture ever commanded men or women to let go of everything so that they may have him. Only Christ, in calling his disciples, in speaking to the people, in all the gospels, we see Jesus tell people to lay down everything, to give up everything, to stop everything and follow him. The only other call that is similar to Jesus is eternal life. Where we are told throughout the scriptures to let go of those things, to let go of this life that's not really life so that we may take hold of eternal life. To let go of these treasures that rust and rot and fade so that we may take hold of that which doesn't fade, which doesn't spoil. And that could only be Jesus. I consider two verses that really, for me, bring clarity to how God, how Jesus is that treasure in the kingdom of heaven. In Genesis 15, 1, when God is making his covenant with Abram, this is what Genesis 15, 15, 1 says. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward let me let me give us a sneak peek into the next verse to hear what abram says in verse 2 abram says lord god what will you give me seeing i got childless and the heir of my house is eliezer of damascus so in that moment god in chapter 15 verse 1 has just told abram I am your exceedingly great reward. As though to tell him, you could have nothing that is as valuable as me. You could have nothing more precious than having me. And in verse 2, Abraham seems to miss that point and wonder what God would give him. And God has just answered in verse 1, there is nothing better than me. When God calls Abraham and tells him to leave his father's house to go to a place he would show him, Abraham's faith was in response to God, who God is, not what God can do. And so that's one where God speaks to man and lets him know that he is indeed his exceedingly great reward. Another verse that's really one of my favorite memory verses that I find so much comfort in, I find so much hope and reassurance in these portions of scripture. And so they begin from uh, Psalm 73, if you're taking note or writing, Psalm 73, uh, from verse 25 to 28. So Psalm 73, from verse 25 to 28. This is what the Bible says. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing, none upon earth that I desire besides you. Verse 26, my flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Verse 27, for indeed those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord that I may declare all your works. I'm reading from the New King James Version. 
Uh, so the words may not align if you're reading from the NIV or ESV. Just thought I'd say that. And so the really, really the key verse for me there is 26, where it says, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Such deep meaning that even when our own flesh fails, even when our own hearts fail us, we still have an interest in God. We still have a portion. We have an inheritance that can never spoil, fed, or wrinkle. And so the first point that I am making is that Jesus is the treasure in the kingdom of heaven. Brothers and sisters, if you have considered anything else to be a treasure, I pray that the Lord today reminds you that it is Jesus, that there is no one else but Jesus. We are reminded of that in, in Colossians where the Bible speaks of Jesus as having the fullness of God dwelling in him, as having all the riches of wisdom and knowledge and grace in him. And so we have in Christ all the treasures that are in heaven, that there is nothing outside of Jesus that could be of any other value. Um, then the second point is that the field within which we find this treasure, because the parable says a treasure hidden in a field, the field within which we find this treasure is the message of the gospel. Both all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And I know that we very easily run to the New Testament and discard the Old. But it is interesting that in all of Jesus' teaching, he could only refer to the Old Testament, and he did so very often. And so in the message of the gospel, we find the whole counsel of God. That is the field within which we come to meet Jesus. Where do men find the Son of God in the message of the gospel? Where do men find the good news of repentance for the forgiveness of sins in the message of the gospel? Where do we find salvation in the message of the gospel? Where do we find the mercy, the grace of God, his faithfulness, his forbearance for sinners, his mercies that are new every morning in the message of the gospel? His love in the message of the gospel. Because all scripture speaks of Jesus. The entire story of the Bible points to him. And very often, many people easily dismiss that and say, ah, ah, nothing in the Old Testament talks about Jesus. But we have countless prophecies within the Psalms, within the letters of the prophets. We just read one from Isaiah. But interestingly, if we won't take the words of, of men of God, let's turn to the scriptures themselves. Because in Luke chapter 24, this is what Jesus says. Because in Luke chapter 24, on the road to a mouse, in chapter 24, verse 27, um, Jesus walks along these disciples of his that are coming and they are discouraged about what has happened. The women have gone to the tomb, they have not found his body. And it's, it's not good. It's not looking good. They are downcast. And in speaking to them, in verse 25, this is what Jesus says. Luke 24, verse 25 onwards. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? In verse 17, the Bible tells us, and beginning at Moses, because we attribute the first books of the Bible to be, have been written by Moses. So beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So it is amazing that we find that throughout the entire message of the Bible, Jesus, this treasure, the treasure of heaven is laid before us because he indeed is the treasure. He is the most valuable and that if we have him, we have everything we need. In another passage in John chapter 20, sorry, John chapter 5, 
uh, verses 39, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees and challenging them because they had rejected him. This is what he says to them in John chapter 5, verses 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. And in verse 40, he tells them, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. What a warning. Because Jesus tells these Pharisees and teachers of the law that had rejected him. And he tells them, you search the scriptures. You daily read them and teach them to the people because you think you will find eternal life within them. Which is true because that is where they would find the message of the gospel, the message of the Messiah. Yet, Jesus says, they are not willing to come to him that they may have that life. And so it is strange that a man or woman should stumble upon the treasure of the good news of Jesus in that field and walk away from it. That a man and woman, or man or woman or, true or child, would come to a church and hear the message of the gospel and have an opportunity to receive Jesus and yet walk away the same. Like I said earlier, to live in a world where the gospel surrounds you on every corner and yet somehow manage to block it out, to resist it, to reject it. I think that that is very sad. And again, to emphasize and amplify the magnitude of this treasure, that who are we that you and I have been blessed that we could see the Lord, that we saw him and that we clung to him, that we said we are not letting go, that we said we will give up everything, that we would renounce everything for the sake of knowing Christ, for the sake of being found in him. That is the kingdom of heaven. That is the treasure that is hidden in the kingdom of heaven. And so in that parable, Jesus is teaching the people. He's speaking to his disciples and he's telling them, the kingdom of heaven is like this, that me, Jesus, I am the treasure in the kingdom of heaven. And if any man should find me within that field of the gospel and sees me for who I am and knows me and accepts me as the son of God, as the savior of all men, that man would not hesitate to sell everything he has so that he can have me. Listen, friends, interesting in the contrast of this gospel, sorry, of this parable, Jesus doesn't say that the man plucks the treasure out of the field and runs with it. No, 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 no. Where he finds it, he leaves it there. Goes, sells everything he has, buys that field so that he may possess that treasure within that field. There are men and women who have believed that they can have Jesus separate from God's word, that they can have a, a God to whom they can cry to, to do for them everything that they want, to solve for them every problem, yet they would not listen to his instructions or to his commands. There are men and women who have been convinced that Jesus is here for them to have abundance in possession, abundance in material wealth, abundance in fame and popularity, abundance in power, and yet reject the message of the gospel. It is impossible. It is impossible to have Jesus as our Lord and Savior if we are all together in the same breath, reject him. A warning within this passage you've read in John chapter 5 is that there can be men and women who day and night are in the Bible reading, who claim to be sold out for God and yet reject Jesus, reject his lordship, reject to let everything else go for him. There are men and women who consider the treasure valuable, but not the most, who consider that, yes, Jesus is good, but I have these other things that I need that I am not willing to let go for the sake of Jesus. And Jesus says that you can either have me and me alone or not have me at all. That we cannot serve both God and money, that our hearts cannot be divided to the Lord and to the world. And so the gospel is the field where we find that treasure. And I pray that we hold on to it. So all men, all women who come to this field, who come to the gospel, have an opportunity, have an opportunity to know Christ, to see him for who he is, to see him for the treasure that he is, to see 
everything that he brings in salvation, to see the redemption that he brings, the forgiveness of sins, the newness of life, and to find that joy and to have it. So Jesus must be, for those of us who call ourselves believers, our most prized possession. We must be completely for him. We can't be half for him and half for the world. That is how valuable, that is how priceless our Lord and Savior is. And so the encouragement for us from this parable is that may we cherish, may we honor, may we love, may we adore, may we worship our Lord for who he is. Because he is that treasure that cannot be priced. We will never know how much it cost to see our Lord and Savior on the cross paying the penalty for our sins. We would never know. We will never know the price because we couldn't pay. We could not achieve our own salvation. We could not purchase it. We could not buy it. But what grace, what mercy that God has called us, that he has opened our eyes, opened our ears, that we would know him. And I pray that if there is anyone on this call who has not received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, who has not made the decision to accept God's free gift of salvation through faith in his son. For whatever reason, I pray that this evening you'd have an opportunity to do that, an opportunity to turn to the Lord. Perhaps you're here and this is not the message of the gospel that you know. Perhaps you've had a different gospel, a gospel of a God that doesn't sound like this one. I pray that this message of the true gospel of Jesus Christ, who is over and above all our most prized possession, who alone is enough for us as his children. I pray that today you come to know that Jesus, that Jesus of whom Paul speaks and says, I consider everything else as rubbish, that there is nothing in my life that I have or own that I would not let go for the sake of knowing Christ, for the sake of being found in him. What a joy, what a privilege. Who are we that we chance upon that treasure in a field? A treasure lying open in a field that anyone could have found, but God in his mercy and grace has led us to that treasure and we have been able to receive his son as our Lord and Savior and we have come into his kingdom. So friends, that's the message of the gospel. That's the message in our parable today in Matthew chapter 13. And I will read it again as I prepare to close and pray with us. Matthew 13, 44 um, says, 40, sorry, Matthew chapter 13, verse 44 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. I specifically left out verses 45 and 46. They're part of our scripture today because I wanted to end with them. If that doesn't paint a clear picture, Jesus offers another illustration and he says in verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl, of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it think about that this is a merchant a man who deals in fine pearls in gems in jewelry but here he finds a pearl of so great a price he was willing to let go of everything that he may possess that one pearl because he considered its value to be far far more than he could estimate Friends, that's the value of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. I pray that our lives would reflect that indeed we hold him so dear, that we hold him so valuable that our lives show that indeed we are his and that we are given to him. I said um, earlier when we read from Matthew that where our treasure is, is where our hearts will be. That indeed if Christ is our great treasure, that indeed if he is in heaven, that our hearts will be in heaven, that our hearts will be set on things that are above, even as we continue to go through this Lent period. 
Let me close for us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for a time such as this, a time to be together in your word, a time to meditate on your word, a time to listen to your voice, a time to quiet all the voices around us, all the busyness of life, all the things that go on each and every single day, that we have an opportunity to be gathered in your presence to hear your voice. We thank you, Lord, for all of us who are here, who have come to find that treasure, who have come to see, to know your son, Jesus, who have come to eternal life through faith in your son. We thank you, Lord, because we know today, if we did not know before, that it is of an a price, it is of a price that we can't count, a price that we can't number. We've come to know today that indeed our salvation, our redemption cost the blood of your son, that our redemption was such a price that we could never have paid, that it is a precious salvation, that it is a salvation that took you, God, to come down in human form that you would redeem us. Lord, I pray this evening that you open our hearts and our eyes to understand how great a salvation it is you have purchased for us. I pray, Lord, that you would awaken our hearts and our minds to how precious you are to us, how we love you, Lord Jesus, how we ought to love you, how we ought to want to know you, how we ought to desire and hunger for you because there is nothing that is more valuable than you. We read in your word that our hearts and our flesh may fail, but Lord, you are the strength of our hearts. You are our portion forever. That Lord, with you, we have an interest that is secure. We have an inheritance that cannot spoil, that cannot fade. We have an inheritance that is secure in eternity. Lord, help us to understand the weight of your preciousness to us. Help us to understand the value, how we ought to cherish you and adore you and love you, how it is proper and fitting that your children revere you and worship you in a way that is fitting for the great God that you are. Father, I pray once again, if there is anyone here who for some reason or whatever has not received you, as our Lord and Savior, who has not come to the saving knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that today will be an opportunity for them. I pray that the message of the gospel will continue to come through, will break through whatever darkness, whatever barriers may have been keeping them out of your kingdom, that, Lord, you would rescue them, that you would snatch them out of the hands of the enemy and bring them into the kingdom of light, in the, into the kingdom of your Son whom you love. Lord, I pray for all of us. I pray even as we continue uh, with our days, as we continue through this Lent period, as we turn to you for so many things, I pray that our hearts will be reminded that you above all are our greatest treasure, that we could possess nothing on the earth, nothing in heaven that is not you, but you and you alone. Lord, continue to reign as our Lord and King Continue to reign as the center of our lives. Continue to reign as our most beloved, as our dear, loving, and saving master. We give you thanks, O oh Lord. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, um, Amen. it has been such a joy and a privilege to share with you. I pray uh, that the message has come to us clearly. I pray that we are encouraged in, in our walk with the Lord. I pray that we are encouraged to hold on to this treasure that is the only treasure in the kingdom of heaven. God bless you. Over to you, Dr. Amen. Thank you so much. The Lord bless you. Thank you for bringing out the word simply, ably, and also for relating them with uh, the deep scriptures that you have well related the topic of the day with I pray that we all feel blessed, we all feel challenged 
we all feel like we need to go back and check our houses and see what other things we've held on to that the Lord is asking us to exchange for the treasures, for the treasure in heaven, who is Jesus. Um, let us close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your for the gift of your word that is bread and bread that is the living bread that gives us life. Bread that has all the ingredients, all the nutrients that our spiritual body will be looking for. Thank you, Father, for indeed um, salvation, your word, the gift of the spirit is like and even better than milk would be to a newborn baby. Father, we need your word. We need deliverance through your word. And therefore, we thank you, Father, that you could remind us of the cost, but also the invaluable value that we get in following you, with which our brother has brought out the word that, Lord, he did not speak in parables or in words that were not clear, but he spoke in words that a new believer, an old believer, can ably understand and apply. And I want to thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you, Lord, for the different styles of preachers that we have. Those who teach, those who share for those gifts among the areas that, Lord, our leadership is seeking to nurture in the cathedral this year. Thank you, Father, for Brother Philip. Thank you for the way every time he is asked to, to preach, that one can clearly tell that he takes time to prepare. He cares for the congregation that you have put before him. And Lord, he's able to just bring forth the word with clarity. We bless his life. We bless the people around him. We bless the sources from which Lord, he draws his messages. And we continue to pray that he'll, the fire in him will continue to burn. We pray that, Lord, like you chose Paul and Barnabas for different congregations and also Peter, that, Father, wherever you have placed him, like in the children's church and many other places, that he'll be very impactful, very impactful, oh God. How blessed we are that we can have teachers and such teachers to support uh, the spiritual life of our children. We pray for ourselves now, Lord. Every time the word is spoken, it's like seed. As your word says in the book of Matthew, that is sown. And as the sower broadcasts the seed, some fell on the rocky soil. Um, where there were, there were briars and thorns and thickets and the others fell in the fertile soil and Lord, there was also the fourth soil. We want to thank you. Lord, when we come before you, our desire is not just to listen to your word as a song, but our desire, oh God, is to say what more can we do to express our love towards you. What more can we do to respond better? What are the distractions in our lives, oh God, that, Lord, we must remove so that we we'll stop being listeners of the word and not doers, oh God? What are those things that we have treasured, oh God, that just cannot die, that just cannot die, Father, that we have failed to exchange for the kingdom of heaven? Lord, the struggles that we have, the different challenges that we have, sometimes are manifestation that we have not yet reached that level where we have sold everything. Sometimes we have done your work with a lot of complaint, even when we are able to follow your instruction. Father, we hold back, we give excuses, 
and we let the opportunity pass. Lord God, we have just listened this evening to the message that we have a treasure in heaven that is laid up for us. Open our spiritual eyes to see if we were called the house of a rich man, if we were called to be diplomats to a nation, if we were called to look at the stores of good things that are for us, and we are told, leave your job, we are told, leave your house and come and have this. We'll be so quick, but Lord, we are so blind, so blind. Your word tells us in the book of uh, Romans chapter eight, and in verse 32, that if God couldn't, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not give us good things? Lord, this verse strikes me when we talk about the treasure in heaven. But if you could not, and you gave up your son, for both the sinner and the one who had given their life to you. Knowing us, as he has said that the father has a great heart, has all those nice attributes of love, of mercy, of provision, everything is in you. And today you are reminding me that we focus so much on the great men of God in the Bible, but their success, the secret to their success was finding this treasure and constantly buying it off. And that led to their success. And if we want that, you have given us what it takes for us to have this treasure. Lord, take complaints out of us. Take anger out of us. Lord, we choose to sacrifice things that we have failed to sacrifice at the foot of the cross. Is it bitterness? Is it unforgiveness? Are they memories that we fail to forget? Are they things that the enemy continues to use to torture us? Is it the businesses we're involved in? We know that the businesses involve a lot of bribes, a lot of risks. But Lord, we've not come to that level of giving them up because we feel that the money in it is a lot. Some of us say, for me, I cannot die poor. I don't want to go back to the village we have all sorts of confessions that are similar to that. As women, we say better to, to cry in a flat or in a bend than to laugh on a bicycle. Sometimes we see that we are in the wrong relationships. We took away people's marriages, but we stick there because of the man's money. You're calling us, Lord. Father, help our spirit, as Prof said, to be quick and willing to trade off whatever is holding us for the kingdom of God. He also said, and as your word says, that you cannot live in a dirty room. You want a vessel that is clean, a vessel that is emptied of all trash. Then there you can come and settle in. Lord, we come before you that will be willing Father, to have you clean us up. Lord God, we want to continue to pray against the deception that he mentioned of men and women who claim to be sold out all for Jesus. Oh, but if you look back, if you pointed, if you spread our lives on a white sheet and started pointing out the dirt in us, there might be so many that would be ashamed of ourselves that the people who may be quietest amongst us and look like they know nothing may actually be the ones that have or are working or are bringing delight to our Father in heaven. Lord, we say thank you because even as he spoke, I was reminded that there are two attributes that stand about you in your word. That is love, that is mercy. When we read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that talks about the attributes of love, 
its ability to endure, to forgive, does not hold the wrongs against us. That's typically describing who you are. And therefore, there's none of us that you cannot help if you gave up your only son. What more? What can't you do for us? That was the biggest thing that you could do for us. Therefore, we could and we can trust you to help us. Lord, is it being mean, failing to share? May you be with us and help us come out of our weaknesses. We don't want to claim to be so saved that we have no sin. Look into our lives. Have mercy, Lord, where we have disappointed the church without even its knowledge because of persistent sin in us. Lord, we have disappointed our spouses where they have sat or they have indicated to us that there are things in us they are not happy with and we continue not to care. Lord, that is not those that are seeking the heavenly king. That is not how people who are seeking the heavenly kingdom, the kingdom that does not fade away, the kingdom that is everlasting, that is not how they behave. Therefore, help us hold our hands, direct us, give strength to those that are struggling, especially those with problems of addiction, addiction to anger, addiction to impulsive spending, addiction to mediocrity at work, low addiction, low addiction to many things, maybe too much love for our biological families and we are failing to meet the needs of our nuclear families, we are failing to show them enough love or oh, some of us are too much into the nuclear that to any other thing we are insensitive. Lord, all those are the earthly treasures that can be spoiled by moth and rodents that you're asking us to look back and deal with. Have mercy on us, oh God, have mercy. Without you, our lives cannot be fulfilled. Without you, we have no joy in this life. Our joy can only be full when we follow, when we, we listen, when we act in alignment with your commandments. We thank you. We continue to cover this altar with the blood of Jesus. We cover the church, all saints, and many others that are seeking you with the blood of Jesus. Lord, we do not forget um, to put in your hands the anti-homosexuality bill that is being tabled in the parliament. Loving Father, there's nothing you cannot do. There's nothing you cannot do. We know that in times like this, monies are exchanging hands, meetings, strategies are being laid. The best people to debate are being fronted. Father, in the name of Jesus, save our nation. Father, in the name of Jesus, save our children. Father, in the name of Jesus, save the African continent. Lord, in the name of Jesus, save your world. Lord, we cancel every plan. We frustrate every plan of the enemy. In the name of Jesus, we pray that even as we continue to stand together, that you will reveal to us the secret meetings that are going on in the dark corners of God. And Father, give us the strategy for prayer. We continue to pray that as we seek for this treasure in heaven, even in this period, Lord, that will not give space to sin so that the enemy can challenge our prayers. No. Father, we choose to walk right so that our prayers can be effective. Your word says that the prayer of a righteous man is effective. And therefore, in the name of Jesus, Father, even as we continue to pray over this bill, Father, I want to pray that we will remember to walk clean. We'll remember to guard our, our, our walk. We'll remember to walk right with you. 
so that our prayer cannot be hindered in the name of Jesus. We pray for the different individuals, congregations that are praying, want to pray that all these prayers will be bundled up and rise in heaven and be placed in the golden bowl as an incense that is sweet and smelling to you, O oh God. We pray for our brothers and sisters at the front lines, especially those that are speaking out against it, O oh God. Father, in the name of Jesus, that they'll fear nothing. They'll set their hearts on the treasures that are above. They'll remember that they have this mission to stand for and to be true citizens and to play their role in the time that you have given them. I pray for people like Pastor Martin Semper that you cover him with the blood of Jesus. I pray against threats to his life. I speak forth that the enemy will not have a hand on his life or God, his family. Lord, even for monitoring spirits that try to, like they did, Lord, to the daughter of Bishop Des, uh, the late Bishop Des, uh, Desmond Tutu, that they'll not go after his children, after his wife or oh God. All their plans shall fail in the name of Jesus. I pray for Family Life Network. Father, in the name of Jesus, that you'll continue to cover the langas, you'll continue to cover all the people they partner with, oh God, as they do this ministry. Lord, give them strategies. We pray for prophets amongst us that, Lord, you'll be able to, to, to speak to them, to unveil the enemy's strategy, and also to unveil, Father, to the brethren and to the nation how we should move, that there will be those that, Father, you will send, oh God. Lord, to state house, to parliament. We want to pray for boldness, for courage, oh God, for the Speaker of Parliament, the Deputy, and the other Father legislators, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Father Lord, we pray that the church will stand as one. We pray against any of the servants of God falling off and supporting this thing. We frustrate those plans in the name of Jesus. Lord, we want to pray, Father, for, 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 for the love of money, Lord, to be dealt with. Father, we pray that um, that love for money will be lost, that however nice the money looks, however much it looks like it will solve the problems of the men of God, the legislators and us all, let us look at the value of the human being, the value of life, Lord, that is, that is, that is backed by the scriptures that we've shared this evening, that will focus on building a future in Uganda of a God-fearing generations, oh God, that will be there to last, O oh Heavenly Father. We want to pray against every move of the enemy, the meetings that are happening in dark corners, we nullify them in the name of Jesus. May you thwart the plan of the enemy in the name of Jesus. We pray for deliverance for the young people. Lord, forgive us where we have been um, violent and sounding unaccepting towards them that even many who would want to come out in the light and ask for help are afraid, oh God. Father, for those who wish to come out and are being threatened by the others, Father, I pray that you provide that, that safe passage, oh God, that Psalm 23 talks of leading them through the valley of the shadow of death. May they come out victorious, oh Lord. Father, we, pre we pray that you prepare the church, you prepare brethren, uh, who may not be in a congregational church, but in the neighborhood, workplaces, and wherever you have placed us, Lord, to position ourselves to be able to pray, counsel, say prayers of deliverance to the, to the people who want to come out, oh God. We know that in marriages, there are marriages also struggling, where people are having the um, heterosexual relationship, but on the side, they also have the one of homosexuality. Therefore, Father, we cancel that in the name of Jesus. Couples are suffering. There are many crying because these spouses want to use them from the wrong part of their body. Father, I want to pray that you will help us that as we walk further through this, may know our goal without prayers being lifted to you. But Lord, will only win this, Father, using strategy. And one of the strategies is to ensure that we get rid of every sin in our lives, sinful conversations, sinful relationships, sinful things that we are doing and we are aware of. We want to pray that we walk straight and are right in you. We thank you, our Father. We continue to pray for the services tomorrow that, Lord, as we transition from this altar, that you continue to resound 
the same message and even better and deeper, oh God, through the different speakers, oh God. We thank you, we bless your name, for it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray and believe. Amen.